This is the most powerful place on earth. The US Capitol building is one of the most recognizable buildings in the world and the center of American government. The world famous dome building is home to the United States House of Representatives and Senate. This place has the power to shape the world more than anywhere else on earth. This is where America's congressmen and congresswomen meet to conduct business, debate laws, form policy and pass bills on behalf of the American people. These leaders possess immense power and influence. Their decisions affect virtually every person on planet Earth. Here on Capitol Hill is a wonderfully unique man who provides spiritual guidance to these leaders and keeps his finger on the pulse of the nation. He's a leader among leaders, brilliant and articulate, yet humble and approachable. He is a force for integrity, goodness, reason and compassion. So join me on a journey along the corridors of power to the very heart of Capitol Hill to meet him and hear a truly American story of how a person from the hood can rise to the heights of the hill and personal and professional success. His story will inspire you and encourage you. And more than that, it may even open new windows to personal success and happiness because his story is more than inspirational. It's a template for true success. The United States of America is the most powerful and influential nation the world has ever seen. It's the world's foremost economic power with its gross domestic product accounting for close to a quarter of the world total. America is also the world's dominant military power with a budget almost as much as the rest of the world's defense spending combined. America's influence is everywhere. It's home to companies known all over the world. McDonald's, Nike, Coca-Cola, Amazon, Google, Apple, and on and on the list goes. Eight of the world's top 10 companies are American. American culture, American movies, American music, American soldiers, American food, American customs, they're all encompassing. No wonder people say there's never been a superpower like the USA in terms of power and influence. And all this has been achieved in less than 250 years. The United States originated in a revolution that separated it from the British Crown in 1776. The American Constitution was drafted 11 years later in 1787 and established a federal system of government with a division of powers that has remained virtually unchanged in form since its inception. Now, there are three branches in the United States government. You see, the founders wanted them to be checks and balances for each other. They didn't want any one group or individual to be able to accumulate too much power. So the three branches are the executive branch, headed by the president, which enforces the law. Then the judicial branch, headed by the Supreme Court, it interprets the law. And finally, the legislative branch, based in the Congress, which writes the laws. Now, the Congress is based here on Capitol Hill and has two parts, the House of Representatives, or the lower house, and the Senate, or the upper house. Now, the basic role of the House of Representatives is to write, vote on, and pass laws while the Senate's job includes approving treaties, confirming judges, and also producing laws. The Senate is composed of two senators from each state. So with 50 states making up the United States, there are 100 senators. Now, the Senate is considered the more prestigious of the two houses and wields immense power and influence. Its decisions affect not only America, 
but the rest of the world as well. Yes, we're all affected by the decisions that are made here. The Founding Fathers realized the huge responsibility resting on these senators. And so way back in 1789, the Senate elected its first chaplain to serve the spiritual needs of the country's lawmakers and to set the tone and provide spiritual guidance at the very highest level of American government. Barry Black is the 62nd chaplain of the United States Senate and the first African-American to hold this office. He's a remarkable man. He's a leader among leaders. He previously served in the US Navy for 27 years and was the Navy's chief of chaplains and rose to the rank of Rear Admiral with many medals and decorations before retiring from the Navy. He's a brilliant and articulate man with a photographic memory. He's got three master's degrees and three doctorates. And yet he's so humble and approachable. President Barack Obama said this about Barry Black. Chaplain Barry Black embodies the best of the American spirit and the Christian tradition. A man of great erudition who has never forgotten his humble roots. A man of great faith who remains open to all the wisdom of all people. A man of great seriousness who knows how to laugh. He opens each session of the United States Senate with a prayer. He advises, counsels and prays with senators who seek his advice. Barry Black is a force for integrity, goodness, reason and compassion along the corridors of power on Capitol Hill. Let's go and meet him. Chaplain Black, thank you for your invitation to the Capitol building and to meet in your office. It's a pleasure to have you on our program today. I'm delighted to be with you, Gary. Chaplain Black, tell us a little about your early life. I grew up in Baltimore, Maryland, which is about 30 miles from Washington, D.C. I grew up in the inner city. It was an urban uh, challenge, actually, an asphalt jungle. And I grew up in a neighborhood that had a great deal of poverty and a great deal of pathology. There were drug pushers, people who sold drugs. Uh, domestic violence was a spectator sport. You could actually sit on your front steps and see uh, someone, I would say a spouse beating another spouse, but you know there weren't a lot of marriage certificates in that neighborhood. And sometimes it was actually the woman uh, chastising the man in a very physical way. Uh, there were temptations, allurements, and it was the challenge of my mother uh, to raise uh, eventually eight children uh, with a nomadic husband who was not around very often and to ensure that we received the harmonious development of our physical, mental, spiritual, and social powers. She wanted to ensure that we had a Christian education. My family was on public assistance, or as we called it back in the 50s and 60s, welfare. And so my mother had to find a way of enabling my siblings and me to matriculate at a Christian school, which we all did from grade one all the way through college and graduate school, although she was a domestic on welfare who made only $6 a day. Chaplain Black, did you ever feel inferior because of where you came from? I think that most African Americans uh, felt inferior because of the very nature of our society at the time. Uh, you have to remember, I was born in the 1940s. Um, I was born before President Harry Truman desegregated the armed forces. Uh, I was born um, at a time when we were called colored, later Negroes, then black, then African American. I was born at a time when we had a phenomenon known as colorism, where the more fair your skin, uh, the more favor you received. And we had a little maxim 
If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. If you're white, you're all right. But if you're black, get back. So there was literally gradations even uh, in the African-American community. Uh, fortunately, however, there is a transformative power in the Word of God. And I started reading the Bible and one day came across the scripture in 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19, for we are redeemed not with corruptible seeds such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And although I was only 10 years of age, I was able to do the deductive reasoning that the value of an object was based upon the price someone was willing to pay. And when it dawned on me that God had sent his son to die for me, no one was ever able to make me feel inferior again. Who had the greatest influence or impact on your life? Gary, the greatest impact on my life was made by my mother. Uh, my mother was pregnant with me when she was baptized. And as she was immersed in the baptismal pool after an evangelistic meeting of 12 weeks, she prayed for the Holy Spirit to place a special anointing on her unborn child. So I never had any desire to be anything but a minister. Uh, my mother reminded me that I was like Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5, set apart in her womb for a special mission. I knew that, but when I saw that most of the ministers were financially challenged, like Jonah, I fled in the opposite direction. Chaplain Black, why did you decide to become a chaplain, a pastor? I, in the 11th grade, went away to a boarding academy uh, for African Americans in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, called Pine Forge Academy. And the best preachers uh, in my denomination would come through for a week and preach and teach. And one evening, uh, after a revival, I walked outside of the chapel in the darkness. I looked up at the heavens and I saw the stars for the first time. You don't see the stars in the inner city. You've got the street lights and that kind of thing. You don't see the stars like you see them in a rural environment with no street lights or anything. And it looked like a fireworks display. And I gasped. And I said, oh my God. And I stood there before what seemed to me the majesty and infinitude of the universe right there in that little field. And I suddenly knew that I didn't know where I had come from, why I was here, and where I was going. And I suddenly was aware of my infinite smallness. I was suddenly cognizant of my frailty the brevity of my existence. And it seemed like I could hear something in my spirit say, Barry, I think it's about time that we get to know one another. And that was the first palpable, experiential and visceral connection that I had with the transcendent. And that was my Damascus road. That was my true call to ministry. Mom had informed me of him. Uh, but like the Queen of Sheba said, we've heard about you, but now we see you, and, and, we, and the half has not been told. And that, that God has been with me from that time until this one. So how did you end up in the Navy? I had a passion to work with young people, and I was pastoring octogenarians. I mean, I, my, I had a man in my church who was over 100 years old. I mean, if you averaged out the age of my congregation, it was, around, it, they were in, it was in the 80s, okay? Uh, and I was in my 20s. And the leaders of my denomination who appointed me to churches said, you're too young to work with young people. You need to be 40, which seemed to me senior citizen in those days. You need to have experience and maturity. So I began to look at options where I could work with young people. I, Looked at prison ministry, certainly plenty of young people there. I looked at an academic ministry on a university campus as a chaplain. I looked at uh, veterans administration, hospital ministry. 
And then uh, a gentleman by the name of Clark Smith called and said, we are looking for ordained Sabbath-keeping ministers to go into the military to help our young sailors, soldiers, Marines who are having difficulty keeping Sabbath. It was my cup of tea, no ifs, ands, and buts about it. It was a protracted honeymoon. I spent 27 years in the Navy, and my worst day was a good day. And I've discovered that God delights in his people taking judicious risk, okay? Peter says in Matthew 14, 28, Lord, if it's you, bid me come and walk with you on the water. In other words, Lord, if it's you, bid me do the impossible. And Jesus says, come. Okay. <laughs> so he has a sense of humor, and he likes for us to take judicious risk. So when you step out of the boat at his bidding, You'll walk on water, and there may be some little sinking, but you'll walk on water. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. So how did you become the Senate chaplain of the United States? I became the, the 62nd chaplain of the United States Senate when the incumbent, Dr. Lloyd John Ogilvie, decided to step down. An eight-member Senate selection committee then interviewed scores of chaplains because each senator, we have 100 senators, was permitted to nominate a minister, priest, rabbi, imam to um, be interviewed for the job. And I was nominated by a member of the Armed Services Committee and went through the first interview where they winnowed down the number to 10. The 10 were then interviewed a second time, and then they winnowed that down to two. And then the two finalists were interviewed by the Senate Majority Leader, who then made a decision as to which of the two would uh, receive the appointment. So it was a very thorough vetting uh, and an amazing and wonderful honor to be selected. And I'm going into my 16th year now, so. Time has flown. What is your role and responsibilities as chaplain of the Senate of the United States? Well, um, each day uh, when the Senate convenes, it is opened with an invocation, a prayer from the chaplain. That has been going on since 1789, uninterrupted prayer, uh, and it is probably the most visible part of what I do, but just the tip of the iceberg. Gary, my role and my responsibilities uh, as the chaplain of the United States Senate um, can probably be, be summed up in uh, the simple statement that I am a pastor to about 7,000 people who make up the Senate side of Capitol Hill. So I, I literally am pastoring a mega church without an associate. Uh, I do four Bible studies every week, one just for the senators, one for the chiefs of staff, the brains of the senators, and then two plenary, anyone who wants to come, Capitol Police, janitors, chefs, you name it, they're all there for the plenary Bible studies. I do a spiritual mentoring class. Every week I meet with our lawmakers for a prayer breakfast. I do counseling. I have a PhD in psychology. I officiated weddings. I officiated funerals and memorial services. I do workspace visitation. I do hospital visitation. So it's a wonderful opportunity to be a pastor to 7,000 people. Looking back over your life, do you think that God has a plan for you? Well, I know God has a plan for every life, Gary. Um, Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plan that I have for your life. And in other words, I'm giving you a window into my mind, into my omniscience. My plan is to prosper you. You're not going to be a poor preacher. My plan is to give you a future. My plan is to give you a hope. My plan is to bring you to an expected end. 
When I was eight years of age, my mother brought home the only record anyone ever gave her, the only record she ever brought home that she was given. And the record said, the morning sun had been up for some hours over the city of David. Yeah, he's not from around here. Pilgrims and visitors were pouring in through the gates, mingling with merchants from villages round about. Shepherds were coming down from the hills, and the narrow streets were crowded. I played it repeatedly until I'd memorized it. It was the record of the sermons of Peter Marshall, the 57th chaplain of the United States Senate. When I wrote my autobiography, From the Hood to the Hill, the editors from Thomas Nelson, who published it, said, we love what you've written. Our only question is, is this fiction or nonfiction? <laughs> I said, it's an autobiography. I said, OK, well, that's good. It's nonfiction. They said, because it would strain credulity that an African-American child in the toxic pathology of the inner city would listen repeatedly to a sermon record by the 57th chaplain of the United States Senate, then grow up to become the only African-American admiral in the history of the United States Navy Chaplain Corps, and before he can retire, is appointed the 62nd chaplain of the United States Senate, a successor to Marshall, and by the way, the only one of African heritage who's ever had the job as well, or the only career military officer who's ever. It would strain credulity, but since it actually happened, I guess we can run with it. So God has a plan, and as you can see from the view in this office, he has definitely led me to a desired destination and to an expected end. Chaplain Black, what message from Capitol Hill would you like to share with our audience? One of the great Americans who has a, a monument on the Washington DC Mall put it this way, we shall overcome, making much out of little, because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We can make much out of little because Carlisle is right. No lie can live forever. We can make much out of little because William Cullen Bryan is right. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. We can make much out of little because James Russell Lowell is right. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future and behind the dim unknown, standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. And as you make much out of little, like that little boy's lunch placed in the hands of the Savior, Galatians 6, 9, do not become weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you faint not. Chaplain Black, you pray for some of the most powerful and influential people on the planet. Would you please offer a prayer for our audience today? Well, I'd love to do that, Gary. And what I would like to do is to offer a prayer that I put at the end of my book, uh, From the Hood to the Hill, uh, that has been attributed to Sir Francis Drake. So let's pray. Disturb us, O God when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams come true simply because they are too small, when we arrive safely simply because we have sailed too close to the shore. Disturb us, O oh God, when with the abundance of the things we possess, we lose our thirst for the waters of life and having fallen in love with life, we cease to dream about eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we permit our vision of a new heaven to dim. Disturb us, O oh God, to dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas where storms will show your mastery where losing sight of land, we will find your stars. 
push back the horizons of our hopes and lead us into a future fueled by faith, focus, and fortitude. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. Chaplain Barry Black's story is certainly encouraging and inspiring. He shows we can overcome the challenges of life, even in a high pressure environment. He shows how a person of modest beginnings can rise to heights of personal and professional success. And he did it by remaining faithful to his values and principles, and above all, faithful to God. Sometimes, we can feel overwhelmed when struggling with the challenges of life. But if you are looking for ways to live a better life and want to find inner peace and true happiness, and if you'd like to get closer to God, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the book, How to Pray. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 333 5 or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. So don't delay. Call or text 0436 333 5 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website to request today's offer. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales 2001, Australia or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey to Capitol Hill and Washington DC, and our interview with Chaplain Barry Black, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. <laughs>